Okay, good evening ladies and gentlemen. It's quite a privilege and an honor to be here, with, especially with Shashi. We went to the same college, the first college he went to. After that, he went on to much more exciting and bigger colleges than I did. And we have I a think certain... it was more exciting than St. Stephen's, I assure you. I agree, I agree. Uh, so, we, have a, we are setting up this conversation as a two-on-one. I hope it works for you guys. I'm going to focus on the book. Uh, I managed to read it. Uh, very intense, tough stuff. And Samira is going to focus on the person behind the personality, Shashi Tarur. So I hope that's okay with you guys. And we hope to keep it as a freewheeling discussion and see uh, how the evening goes. Samira, over to you. First question. The world for me is a beautiful place. So well organized. Everything in order. You have Trump so busy every day with his endless tweets with policy change happening overnight. You have India in harmony, people sitting together and having fun. Shashi, come on, tell me. The new world disorder and the Indian imperative? I don't agree. I believe we are in a most peaceful world at present. Well, clearly you live in an alternative universe, dear Samira. <laughs> but if you were to look around the world today, uh, I, I'm sorry to say that I, you know, see nothing but disorder. If you look at, uh, no one would have expected to see uh, in the last couple of years, Britain and the US emerging as threats to geopolitical stability. And yet with the Brexit vote in Britain and the chaos ensuing from that, and the Trump election in America, and the chaos ensuing from those 3 a.m. tweets and uh, and even sort of threats of nuclear annihilation of North Korea and Iran and so on, there is a tremendous amount of turbulence emanating from the very countries that used to pride themselves on being sources of global stability. On top of that, you have the rise of China, obviously with the sudden setback now of the coronavirus, but assuming that that's temporary as SARS turned out to be, they are essentially challenging the established order in quite a fundamental way. And countries like India and others who are committed to the international system but find themselves excluded from the high table, we're also facing enormous challenges. I often have joked that um, in international affairs, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And yeah. we, have been, uh, we have been eaten for lunch by others for a very long time. A country like us, I think, can graduate, is ready to graduate from being a rule taker to being a rule maker on the global stage. But we don't seem to have stepped up to the plate yet uh, in doing that. So all of these issues are worth discussing. The, the prism through which I see it is the concept of global governance, which is the idea that from 1945, when we'd had these horrible preceding half century featuring the Holocaust and Hiroshima and everything else, that the world was going to establish a system that would keep everybody more or less at peace and development and so on with the, the slogans of the time. And yet, Samira, we've ended up with, um, with some real fraying of the edges of that consensus of that time. Shashi, you stole my first question. I mean, you've already answered one question that I wanted to ask. You've co-authored 19 best-selling books. A few of them are co-authored. I mean, you've authored 19 best-selling books. Two or three are co-authored. How did this co-author business come about with Samir Sharan? Okay, so this is a bit different because my other co-authored books, two were basically coffee table books. M.F. Hussain Saab did some paintings of Kerala and I did the text. So the writing was purely me. Similarly, the Franco-Italian photographer Ferrante Ferranti took some pictures and I did the text. So those two were purely uh, me text, somebody else's art. And then uh, there's a book called uh, um, uh, Shadows Across the Playing Field, which is a survey of Indo-Pakistan cricket, which is also co-authored with the Pakistani cricket administrator and former foreign secretary, Shariar Khan. But again, there were two independent bits of writing. I wrote about India-Pakistan cricket from my point of view as a fan and an Indian. He wrote about the same subject from his point of view as an administrator and a Pakistani. And the two narratives are juxtaposed. One half of the book is me, one half of the book is him. So again, no real co-writing. This is the first one where it was genuine co-authorship. 
Samir Saran is the president of a think tank in Delhi, the Observer Research Foundation. Very bright young man. And uh, he and I have been involved because I brought to that foundation a thing called, uh, uh, well, in Germany, it's called the Buserius Summer School for Global Governance. It's, uh, it's an annual exercise run by a German foundation, the Zeit Foundation, that actually brings young leaders from around the world for them, it's under 40. Uh, and they're very, very ambitious in that the people at the, around the table are usually people of very, very high distinction already before they come to this summer school. And people like me were invited to advise them, instruct them on principles of global governance. So I went there and uh, lectured every summer. It was a break for me from my UN duties. And one year, I think it was 2005, one of the students amongst the group of bright young achievers was a certain Rahul Gandhi. So that was the kind of level at which that fund. So when we, this went on for some time, they asked me, don't you think we could do an Asian version of this? So I said, yes, but you'll need an Asian partner. So I said, why don't they try in India? And after a couple of unsuccessful forays, I stumbled across the idea of going to the Observer Research Foundation ever since we have been doing this Asian Forum on Global Governance. Meanwhile, I had returned to India for good, and I became the dean of it. So every year, for about one week and two weekends, we invite about 50 young people from around the world. For us, it's under 35 rather than under 40, because we don't aim for the Rahul Gandhis, and we've even had ministers and so on. But we get uh, relatively early um, starting people to come and we talk to them from an Indian perspective about these issues. So Samir and I know each other for over 10 years of running this thing, where I was the dean and he was the principal uh, host, as it were, from the ORF. And we said, why not try and make a book out of what we've been talking about? Um, and the, what we've done here is, as I said, genuine co-authorship, with the exception of one chapter, which I wrote the first draft of and he wrote. Otherwise, the deal was, I'm very busy, I've got parliament, I've got all my headaches. You do the first draft of a chapter, send it to me, and I will make corrections, subtractions, changes, and additions, send it back to you. You agree, then we move on to the next chapter. And in that way, for someone like me, who's been had a very hectic last couple of years, as you know, the lead up to the Lok Sabha elections, the election themselves, and the, uh, and the immediate aftermath have been quite fraught. It was inconceivable to write a book from scratch any other way. So I'm very grateful. I don't want to make a habit of co-authoring, but this time it worked very well. Uh, and not everything there is what Samir would agree with. And not everything there is what I would agree with. We have tried to come to a true meeting of minds on these larger issues. So coming to a meeting of minds and taking you back to what you first spoke, India has a very strong network of partnerships. And you also mentioned that India is a rule taker. And we want it ideally to move into it being a rule maker. So is this a strong Indian sentiment that you are trying to start? Or is it a case of flossy nossy helipification? <laughs> <laughs> no, listen, I, 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 flossy nossy helipification merely is a made up word talking about estimating somebody or something as worthless. And I don't think any of this is worthless. For example, I think the global governance arrangements that were arrived at in 1945 did a lot of good, right? Because there's been no World War III, for one thing. They were able to keep global peace. They were able, in many ways, to preside over an era of decolonization, where the majority of the world's peoples flung off the colonial yoke, and development became the new buzzword, and some of the, of the former colonizers took some responsibility for assisting development, etc. So lots of good things happened, international treaties, international agreements, lots of positive things in the world. At the same time, not everything was as positive which, as it should be. First of all, there were winners and there were losers. And by and Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's quite a privilege and an honor to be here, with, especially with Shashi. We went to the same college, the first college he went to. After that, he went on to much more exciting and bigger colleges than I did. And we have I a think it was more exciting than St. Stephen's, I assure you. I agree, I agree. Uh, so we, have a, we are setting up this conversation as a two-on-one. 
I hope it works for you guys. I'm going to focus on the book. Uh, I managed to read it. Uh, very intense, tough stuff. And Samira is going to focus on the person behind the personality, Shashi Tharoor. So I hope that's okay with you guys. And we hope to keep it as a freewheeling discussion and see uh, how the evening goes. Samira, over to you. First question. The world for me is a beautiful place. So well organized. Everything in order. You have Trump so busy every day with his endless tweets with policy change happening overnight. You have India in harmony. People sitting together and having fun. Shashi, come on, tell me. The new world disorder and the Indian imperative? I don't agree. I believe we are in a most peaceful world at present. Well, clearly you live in an alternative universe, dear Samira. But if you were to look around the world today, uh, I, I'm sorry to say that I, you know, see nothing but disorder. If you look at, uh, no one would have expected to see uh, in the last couple of years, Britain and the US emerging as threats to geopolitical stability. And yet with the Brexit vote in Britain and the chaos ensuing from that, and the Trump election in America, and the chaos ensuing from those 3 a.m. tweets and, uh, and even sort of threats of nuclear annihilation of North Korea and Iran and so on, there is a tremendous amount of turbulence emanating from the very countries that used to pride themselves on being sources of global stability. On top of that, you have the rise of China, obviously with the sudden setback now of the coronavirus, but assuming that that's temporary as SARS turned out to be, they are essentially challenging the established order in quite a fundamental way. And countries like India and others who are committed to the international system, but find themselves excluded from the high table, we're also facing enormous challenges. I often have joked that um, in international affairs, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And yeah. we, have been, uh, we have been eaten for lunch by others for a very long time. A country like us, I think, can graduate, is ready to graduate from being a rule taker to being a rule maker on the global stage. But we don't seem to have stepped up to the plate yet uh, in doing that. So all of these issues are worth discussing. The prism through which I see it is the concept of global governance, which is the idea that from 1945, when we'd had these horrible preceding half century featuring the Holocaust and Hiroshima and everything else, that the world was going to establish a system that would keep everybody more or less at peace and development and so on with the, the slogans of the time. And yet, Samira, we've ended up with, um, with some real fraying of the edges of that consensus of that time. Shashi, you stole my first question. I mean, you've already answered one question that I wanted to ask. You've co-authored 19 best-selling books. A few of them are co-authored. I mean, you've authored 19 best-selling books. Two or three are co-authored. How did this co-author business come about with Samir Sharan? Okay, so this is a bit different because my other co-authored books, two were basically coffee table books. MF Hussain Saab did some paintings of Kerala and I did the text. So the writing was purely me. Similarly, the Franco-Italian photographer Ferrante Ferranti took some pictures and I did the text. So those two were purely uh, me text, somebody else's art. And then uh, there's a book called uh, um, uh, Shadows Across the Playing Field, which is a survey of Indo-Pakistan cricket, which is also co-authored with the Pakistani cricket administrator and former foreign secretary, Shariar Khan. But again, there were two independent bits of writing. I wrote about India-Pakistan cricket from my point of view as a fan and an Indian. He wrote about the same subject from his point of view as an administrator and a Pakistani. And the two narratives are juxtaposed. One half of the book is me, one half of the book is him. So again, no real co-writing. This is the first one where it was genuine co-authorship. Samir Saran is the president of a think tank in Delhi, the Observer Research Foundation. Very bright young man. And uh, he and I have been involved because I brought to that foundation a thing called, uh, uh, well, in Germany, it's called the Buserius Summer School for global governance. It's, a, it's an annual 
exercise run by a German foundation, the Zeit Foundation, that actually brings young leaders from around the world. For them, it's under 40. Uh, and they're very, very ambitious in that the people at the, around the table are usually people of very, very high distinction already before they come to this summer school. And people like me were invited to advise them, instruct them on principles of global governance. So I went there and uh, lectured every summer. It was a break for me from my UN duties. And one year, I think it was 2005, one of the students amongst the group of bright young achievers was a certain Rahul Gandhi. So that was the kind of level at which that fun. So when we, this went on for some time, they asked me, don't you think we could do an Asian version of this? So I said, yes, but you'll need an Asian partner. So I said, why don't they try in India? And after a couple of unsuccessful forays, I stumbled across the idea of going to the Observer Research Foundation. Ever since we have been doing this Asian Forum on Global Governance, meanwhile, I had returned to India for good, and I became the dean of it. So every year, for about one week and two weekends, we invite about 50 young people from around the world. For us, it's under 35 rather than under 40, because we don't aim for the Rahul Gandhis, and we've even had ministers and so on, but we get uh, relatively early uh, starting people to come and we talk to them from an Indian perspective about these issues. So Samir and I know each other for over 10 years of running this thing, where I was the dean and he was the principal uh, host, as it were, from the ORF. And we said, why not try and make a book out of what we've been talking about? Um, and what we've done here is, as I said, genuine co-authorship, with the exception of one chapter, which I wrote the first draft of and he wrote. Otherwise, the deal was, I'm very busy, I've got parliament, I've got all my headaches. You do the first draft of a chapter, send it to me, and I will make corrections, subtractions, changes, and additions, send it back to you. You agree, let me move on to the next chapter. And in that way, for someone like me, who's been had a very hectic last couple of years, as you know, the lead up to the Lok Sabha elections, the election themselves, and the, uh, and the immediate aftermath have been quite fraught. It was inconceivable to write a book from scratch any other way. So I'm very grateful. I don't want to make a habit of co-authoring, but this time it worked very well. Uh, and not everything there is what Samir would agree with, and not everything there is what I would agree with. We have tried to come to a true meeting of minds on these larger issues. So coming to a meeting of minds and taking you back to what you first spoke India has a very strong network of partnerships and you also mentioned that India is a rule taker and we want it ideally to move into it being a rule maker. So is this a strong Indian sentiment that you are trying to start or is it a case of flossy nossy nilipification? <laughs> No, listen, I, 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 Floxinus in Helipidification merely is a made up word talking about estimating somebody or something as worthless. And I don't think any of this is worthless. For example, I think the global governance arrangements that were arrived at in 1945 did a lot of good, right? Because there's been no World War III, for one thing. They were able to keep global peace. They were able, in many ways, to preside over an era of decolonization where the majority of the world's peoples flung off the colonial yoke and development became the new buzzword and some of the, of the former colonizers took some responsibility for assisting development, etc. So lots of good things happened, international treaties, international agreements, lots of positive things in the world. At the same time, not everything was as positive as it should be. First of all, there were winners and there were losers and by and large, the winners were the rich developed countries and the losers were the rest of us. So when, for example, we talk about peace and security, yes, there was a peace for a very long time in Europe, but a lot of conflict was exiled to the periphery. So countries like ours, many countries in Africa, Latin America, elsewhere, endured pretty bad conflict. And to tell them, you tell today the people of Syria or parts of Libya or parts of Iraq, that we are living in a great era of global peace, as Samir was, Samira was suggesting, uh, obviously they would look totally bewildered because their lives are held today, uh, which they weren't when Europe was at war. So there's one example. Another would be issues like climate change, right? These Western countries have developed uh, with complete disregard for the environment. Today they've woken up to the fact that the environment is under threat. 
and they want the rest of us to behave and to stop polluting and so on and so forth. Now, obviously, as an Indian, I don't want to live with the consequences of climate change, but equally, I'm very conscious that Indians or 250 million Indians are unable to take for granted what any Irishman or Icelander can do, which is they can walk into a room and flick a switch on the wall and find themselves bathed with light. We can't do that for many of our people. So there are still basic challenges to be overcome in providing such things to people that will in turn involve some emissions. But where you look at India as a country with 17% of the world's population and we're generating 4% of the emissions. You look at America with 5% of the world's population generating 27% of the emissions and apparently they're the virtuous ones and we are the the villains of the peace because we have all these coal-fired thermal plants spewing stuff into the air. Somewhere or the other, a balance has to be struck and solutions found that are fair to everybody. So these are the kinds of issues. There are many, many other issues in the book. But just to give you a couple of examples of the kinds of ways in which what seemingly has worked and which I myself as a UN official would talk about how the international system has worked well for the world. Nonetheless, there are people on the world for whom it could work better. And that's what this is about. Shashi, you worked at the UN between 1978 and 2007, 2008, uh, year, 2007. You, you've seen it up close in many different ways. Yeah. Looking back, what do you think has worked for the UN as an organization? And where are the areas you feel it's failed? You've covered a lot of that in the book, but I'd like you to share that with the audience. Well, I think one thing that worked, uh, many of you will probably agree, is that when there was this awful Cold War superpower standoff, when literally anything might have ignited another global conflagration, at that time the UN was able to provide a mechanism to prevent that happening. And for example, the invention by Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld of the whole concept of peacekeeping, which was actually never foreseen in the UN Charter. The UN Charter was written up by the Allies of World War II and they assumed they'd stay alive. So the US and the Soviet Union were on the same side and they wrote a charter under which their generals would meet and keep peace around the world. But when the Cold War came and they were on opposite sides, that was no longer possible. So instead, countries like India, Ireland, Fiji, you know, you had Sweden and so on, they started providing troops to the UN under Hammarskjöld's initiative to keep the peace in conflict areas where if the peace had not been kept, the conflict could have drawn in the superpowers and ignited a major war. So that's something, for example, that I thought the UN did rather well. And rightly, it won the Nobel Peace Prize for that effort, um, quite remarkably. Another thing the UN did very well was humanitarian work. I spent the first 11 years of my UN career with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, dealing with some of the most intractable problems of Vietnamese boat people crisis. Um, we went through the Afghan refugee crisis. We had... Uh, the, the Central American refugee crisis after the war in Salvador, the Horn of Africa crisis, and before my time, of course, the, the Bangladesh crisis, when, when the largest single refugee movement in human history, 10 million Bengalis fl fled uh, the, the Pakistani forces in East Pakistan came over to us. So all of these things, the UN was able to step in and, and help contain, help resolve. And one good thing about the UN is when the UN deals with a problem, you don't have to worry about some country's political agenda being pushed. You know, I mean, you know, you, you see these uh, crises and these bags of relief coming, saying gift of the United States of America and so on. And you feel, oh my gosh, how humiliating that we have to get this. Whereas when the UN's flag flies, everyone has a stake in it. Everyone belongs to the UN and UN assistance, even though it may have come from the same rich countries is something that everyone can equally feel proud about. I think that worked rather well as well. Uh, development worked in a middling way, but at least the development agenda was there. Uh, the message was given that people have an obligation to help countries develop. So those are the things, treaties. The UN became the place to negotiate all sorts of international treaties and agreements. And one more thing is the agenda setting function. You know, every major issue we are conscious of today started off at some point in a UN conference. For example, we're all much more conscious of the environment today. And, and we weren't, right? So in the 70s, the first, I think, 73, the UN organized a conference in Stockholm on the environment. 
and Indira Gandhi went there and spoke for India and so on and became the first time that the world actually focused collectively on the planetary challenge that environmental damage represented. And then you had Rio in 92, you've had Tokyo, you've had, you had various, various processes since most recently Mexico, which didn't actually do so well. But the idea is that the UN can set the agenda and, and oblige every country in the world to participate in a discussion of what this is all about. So all of those things I would say would work. And you know, they were pretty um, adaptable. If I had told my seniors at the UN when I joined it in 1978, that I thought I was joining an organization which would one day impose sanctions on the entire import-export trade of a member state, uh, 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 an organization that would one day take over political control of an entire country and run elections there, uh, uh, an organization that would uh, set up an international criminal court to try sometimes heads of state, former heads of state, for crimes against their own citizens in a foreign country far away. If I'd mentioned any of those things, I think my seniors, since it was the 1970s, they would have asked me, hey Shashi, what are you smoking? You know, this was not what anyone understood the UN to be at that time. And yet in the course of my career, the UN did all of those things and more. So the fact is that the ability to adapt and adjust to changing demands in the world has also featured positively for the UN. So when I ran for Secretary General, my message was, yes, we need to reform the UN, not because it's lousy, but because it's done well enough to be worth reforming, to do even better in the future. And that's the sort of thing I, I think one could. But the US didn't want you, they vetoed you, right? They sent a message through the ambassador saying, we don't want a strong Secretary General. Yeah, I was rather disloyal of their ambassador to report that in his memoir, but yeah. That's what he says he got. So uh, no strong Secretary General and uh, we know what happened. But, you know, looking back, I did what I had to do. And I, I believe that um, one picks oneself up and moves on. You know, I kind of felt that I'd spent my whole life in preparation for that because um, uh, I, had, I had really an unusual UN career and that I'd done every single one of the major activities of the UN. I began with humanitarian work, refugees, spent time in the Security Council, handled peacekeeping, ran the largest operation in Yugoslavia, ended up in management, running the, uh, sorry, worked in the Secretary General's office for an entire term, then ended up in management, so dealing with budget, personnel, reform, pruning staff, all of that stuff. So I'd done pretty much everything, and I thought, you know, somehow this was fated, but fate had other plans. <laughs> and, so, and so you sort of realize at the end of the day, you do something because you feel it's what you're meant to do. But if it turns out not to work out, you know, that isn't the end of the world. You've got to pick up and find something else to do. And I found it here. I remember meeting your mother, Margaret Alva, when she came to uh, the United Nations in the very late 80s or early 90s. She'd come as a part of the General Assembly delegation. We got along like a house on fire. And we saw each other on her frequent visits thereafter. Little did I realize that one day I would be following her into her with party politics in India. It's just farthest thing from my mind. But Life because it's done on. well enough to be worth reforming, to do even better in the future. And that's the sort of thing I, I think one could... But the US didn't want you, they vetoed you, right? They sent a message through the ambassador saying, we don't want a strong Secretary General. Yeah, I was rather disloyal of their ambassador to report that in his memoir, but yeah, that's what he says he got. So, um, no strong Secretary General and... Uh, we know what happened, but you know, looking back, I did what I had to do, and I, I believe that um, one picks oneself up and moves on. You know, I kind of felt that I'd spent my whole life in preparation for that because um, uh, I had I had really an unusual UN career, and that I'd done every single one of the major activities of the UN. I began with humanitarian work, refugees, spent time in the Security Council handled peacekeeping, ran the largest operation in Yugoslavia, ended up in management, running the, uh, sorry, worked in the Secretary General's office for an entire term, then ended up in management, so dealing with budget, personnel, reform, pruning staff, all of that stuff. So I'd done pretty much everything, and I thought, you know, somehow this was fated, but fate had other plans. <laughs> and, so, and so you sort of realize at the end of the day, you do something because you feel it's what you're meant to do. 
But if it turns out not to work out, you know, that isn't the card, you know, that isn't the end of the world. You've got to pick up and find something else to do. And I found it here. I remember meeting your mother, Margaret Alva, when she came to uh, the United Nations in the very late 80s or early 90s. She'd come as a part of the General Assembly delegation. We got along like a house on fire. And we saw each other on her frequent visits thereafter. Little did I realize that one day I would be following her into her party politics in India. It was farthest thing from my mind. But life goes on, you know, and that's, that's what happened. So now that we have you with us and you have been involved in agenda setting, where do you feel we can drive India forward? What are the key areas to actually create a new world order? Look, I mean, that's probably a very tall order, but let's get a couple of things straight. Um, right now, the people who are on top of this, at this high table that I called it, they are not exactly in a hurry to squeeze their elbows in and make room for new people. And the irony is countries like China and India and Brazil for that matter, South Africa, others, they're not really anxious to knock the table over. Unlike if you're a history fan, you know that at the beginning of the 20th century, the long peace from 1815 onwards that had kept Europe at peace essentially ended because countries like Germany and Japan just didn't like the existing world order and said, we need a new world order, we're going to destroy this one. I feel that countries like China and India actually just want to be accommodated within the existing world order. They're not actually trying to turn it uh, upside down. But what's happening is the small-mindedness of the leaders of the richer countries has actually prevented the kind of progress that might have staved off a crisis. I'll give you one example. In 2008, the G20 met in Pittsburgh. And they said, you know, given all that's happening, the growth... I mean, China, for example, at that point, had the same weighted vote in the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, GATT, the... The Bretton Woods institutions are the institutions set up at a place called Bretton Woods in New Hampshire, basically to manage the world economy at the end of the Second World War. And why should China had the same weighted vote as Belgium? And it seemed absurd because China, obviously, of 2008 was not the China of 1945. And so they naturally wanted more authority and more, more space, and India supported that. And there were also other emerging economies like India, where we had risen in terms of our market. And there were the so-called transition economies, that is the former East European countries, who no longer being under the communist straitjacket, they'd opened up and they were also growing rather rapidly. So the deal was arrived at in 2008 that there would be now 50-50 parity between the voting power of the rich developed countries on the one hand and the emerging and transition economies, including China and India, on the other. Seemed a fair deal, everyone agreed, everyone went very happy. That was 2008, September. 2009 went by, 10 went by, 11 went by, 12 went by. It never got implemented. Why? Because to implement such a deal, you need the agreement of all the key powers who currently are sitting on top of the Bretton Woods institutions. And in the U.S.'s case, the U.S. Senate had to ratify it. And the U.S. Senate just didn't ratify it. It finally was in the first months of 2016. Seven, seven years later that they did that. Seven and a half years later, January or February, February 2016, that they finally ratified this deal. Now, in the meantime, what happened? The Chinese and the Indians started saying, we're never going to get a fair shake from these guys. They ended up setting up the BRICS New Development Bank. You remember about that? Shanghai with Mr. Kamath from India as the president and the Chinese offering to host it and, and provide the basic expenses. What was the signal there? I mean, the signal that I got is very clear. We want a level playing field, but if you won't give us a level playing field, we'll go off and build a playing field of our own. And China, because it had become so rich in the meantime, actually has the strength to make such a threat stick. You know, why would a small country need to go to the World Bank, where China doesn't have a vote? If it can go to a bank where China not only has the vote, makes the decisions and has the money to give them. They don't care where they get the money, they want the money for their development. So this suddenly became a very important warning shot across the bow that says to these rich countries, listen guys, you want to play it your way, you'll end up playing by yourselves. We'll go. This is exactly um, 
this problem you've described really incisively. You say that today's power st structures are anachronistic. They reflect 20th century power politics in which the US is in the driver's seat. But the 21st century world is a very different place. Um, what, how should the US get up tomorrow and look at the world differently? What would you prescribe? Well, uh, Mr. Trump is already confusing the heck out of everybody, right? Because one day he wants to pull all his troops out of every country that they're in. He literally has just issued a statement welcoming the Philippines' decision to kick the Americans out of the bases they built in the Philippines. That was last week. Uh, he has announced his desire to withdraw from Afghanistan, which obviously uh, will be a gift horse to the, um, to the uh, Taliban, who promptly will take over. Uh, he has um, announced his desire to pull out of Syria. Uh, he doesn't want to send his troops anywhere abroad. Uh, he wants to make America great again by making it not great internationally, by focusing on his domestic situation. That's his choice. But in that case, nature abhors a vacuum. Who's going to fill it? If it's China, some of us have to worry. If you have a China playing a role on the global stage that's analogous to the role that the um, US has played for the last 50 years, I think that countries like India would have a lot to worry about because the US, for all its, all its overreach, was a benign power. I mean, yes, Americans had their motives and their motives largely had to do with making money. With China, the motives may have to do with other things. And that's what truly worries many of us to look at the global geostrategic picture. So a world order in which China's weight and rise is recognized duly, but where other countries like India have recognized places as well, a multipolar world is one that many of us would like to work towards. India has further virtues. It's a democracy. I hope still it is. I mean, I have some worries about where that's going. But it is a democracy. It is a pluralist society. It's a society with... Uh, remarkably successful management of its own diversities. And it's a country which has, frankly, the capacity, the human resources, the technological ability, and the, the, the diplomatic skills to actually help make these rules that we were talking about earlier on everything from cyberspace to outer space. Why shouldn't we? And so what I, we are prescribing in the book is a world in which a country like India would play a much more influential role. I don't know how many of you who read my books have read a book called Pax Indica, which I published in 2012. That was actually a study of India's foreign policy. But I came to the same conclusion from this way. So in other words, I studied India's relations with various countries and our overall strategy as a for, as a, in, in the world of international affairs. And I concluded with a plea that we should take on a far more active role on the world stage. The plea was ignored, but that was my conclusion now, eight years ago in that book, in this book, I don't discuss Indian foreign policy. We start off looking at the world, global governance, but we end up in the same place, which is that India and a country like India for all its virtues has and should have an influential role to play. Now, obviously, my co-author and I will probably part company on what I would say next, which is that what worries me about today's domestic political context is that the India that is being shaped in the last six months since my manuscript went off to press is unfortunately an India that is not quite the India I described that's ready to play an influential role on the world stage because an India that seems to be more sectarian, more narrow-minded, more intolerant of dissent, more unwilling to cope with its diversity or even recognize its diversity as a strength rather than as a weakness in India that in many ways has become the India of the CAA protests, that India will not be an example to anybody else in the world and will probably not be welcomed uh, in the way that I would have hoped when I was writing this book. So going by what you said, India is still a key player in global governance and development. You have US on one hand who is a geopolitical leader. You have China on the other who is geoeconomic. As you said, India is into the technological front, cyberspace, outer space. What more do you envision for our country? I was wondering where you were going with this geopolitical, geoeconomic. 
and India seems to be Jew, just Jew. <laughs> <laughs> but she didn't, she resisted the temptation. I just succumbed to it. The fact is that uh, my dreams for India are obviously uh, to echo Nehruji's wonderful speech. I don't know, you know, how many of you anymore remember the Tris with Destiny speech. I think my generation still read it in school and studied it. But it's striking that at a time when the flames of partition were blazing across the land, Nehruji not only talked about our trips with destiny, but he said that his dreams were not only for India, but for humanity as a whole. Uh, and he talked about, in 1947, he talked about how peace is indivisible. That ultimately the world, he said in 72 years ago, 73 years ago almost, he said the world is too tightly knit together for any one of us to believe that we can live apart. I think that that is the vision that India should be able to bring again. Unfortunately, we have a government that's too busy insulting and repudiating Nehru to be inspired by what he stood for and the ideals and visions that India actually offered the world at that time. Um, as somebody who's quite unabashed in my admiration for that vision, that's essentially the vision that inspires my share of this book. Reading your book, what really hits me is just how dramatically the world has changed since the Great Recession 2007, 2009 and 2020. Some of the things you talk about are inequality, the whole majoritarianism space. Uh, we have 2,153 billionaires uh, who own more than, you know, 4.6, what 4.6 billion people own. And this seems to be just increasing in countries around the world. So, uh, and when you have austerity me measures, they hurt the poor the most. Just a little bit about how things have, literally last six, seven, eight years. You know what happened, uh, Niret, is that we actually seen, we've seen two backlashes against globalization. Globalization, I would say the era of pure globalization is about 1980 to uh, 2008 when the mantra was more trade, more openness of borders, where you could move uh, millions and billions across the world with a click of a cursor, where um, we were knit together first by satellite TV, then by the internet, uh, where the global village that Marshall McLuhan wrote about in the 60s suddenly seemed to have become a total reality. And then you've got a kind of a recession which then provokes a rather significant backlash that we are seeing in the political consequences in a large number of countries west of us. And I would say two backlashes rather than one because they're actually different. They overlap in some places and they don't in others. I'll tell you what I mean. There's the economic backlash. The economic backlash is largely animated by blue collar workers and others in the western countries who found their jobs being Shanghai. I mean, literally their jobs being sent off to China and for many of them, the American dream was, you know, for three generations, Americans bought into the myth that every generation would have a bigger home and a better car and a prettier wife and white picket fence and 2.3 children and a dog, you know, all of that more than their parents had. And for kind of three generations, it worked. Suddenly, the first generation to discover that the jobs they were counting upon to deliver that better image for them those jobs have gone. They're no longer there. Uh, I don't know how many of you saw a film uh, uh, called Roger and, Moore, uh, and Me by Michael Moore. Uh, uh, one of the first documentary films that actually played like a feature film in movie theaters. Um, now about 20 years ago. Where he talked about how in the town of Flint, Michigan, where there was factory after factory owing allegiance to General Motors and companies like that. Uh, and where this American dream was being played out. That suddenly these factories are closing. They were closing altogether because it was cheaper to make these cars in Mexico and later, of course, in China. And suddenly you found a lot of people being deeply resentful. The American consumer gained because every item that was being produced was still being produced and he was paying less for it. And he was paying less for it in places like Walmart and so on than he actually used to pay or would have needed to pay if Americans earning American wages were producing it. But while the American consumer was earning more, the, the American worker was not. And that kind of thing 
happened across the Western world and you had this economic backlash. But there was also a culture of the Western world and you had this economic backlash. But there was also a cultural backlash that accompanied it. Because the economic backlash came in some countries with an awareness that the economic decisions that were being taken were being taken by a ruthless cosmopolitan elite in the boardrooms of financial firms like Goldman Sachs or Lehman Brothers by Davos man, to use the famous phrase of Huntington, Davos man flitting around the world and addressing global issues in places like Switzerland. And that that Davos man was making decisions out of a sense of deracination and disconnectedness to these poor workers. So from there came a rejection of cosmopolitanism, a rejection of internationalism and of globalization that then manifested itself in a certain amount of xenophobia and racism. The British philosopher David Goodhart has written about the world being divided into somewheres and anywheres. So the somewheres are these global cosmopolitans who can be comfortable in business class lounges anywhere in the world and attend conferences in five-star hotels anywhere in the world, jet run, totally relaxed, wherever, whichever global capital they go to. But the anywhere is the people who are rooted locally in one place. They speak one language. They worship one religion. They are usually one color of skin. And they had felt threatened during the wave of globalization by the influx of all of these. And because of that, their backlash took on the form of hostility to foreigners, people of other faiths, other colors, other languages. So Brexit, for example, was as much about hearing foreign languages being spoken in the streets of London as it was about the overweening influence of the EU bureaucracy on, on, on the British economy. And in America, when Trump was saying, make America great again, the unspoken words beneath were make America white again, which actually can't happen because the demographic change in America has already gone well beyond his ability to reverse it. But I'm just saying that there is all this element as well. Now, we have a paradox of people like Narendra Modi here and Erdogan in Turkey. Because they participate in the cultural backlash. They claim to be more authentic representatives of their people, rooted in Islam in Turkey, in Hinduism here, rooted much more representative of the biases, the prejudices, the languages, the everything of their own people, unlike the guys who are Davos man, but they don't want to reject Davos man. The economic backlash, they don't want. They want to be part of Davos. They want to be, in other words, globalized economically because they're gaining from it, but they want to be localized politically, culturally, their own countries. So there are two backlashes. I'm sorry to give you such a long answer to your question, but that's what we're living with today, is a world of two different backlashes. So in America and Britain, both like uh, backlashes overlap. In India, we separate them very clearly. We're not rejecting the world yet. We're rejecting the world, if you like, culturally. And this government in particular doesn't like people who don't subscribe to Hindi, Hindutva, Hindustan. But when it comes to the world economy, boy, they want, you know, every high honcho in Davos to eat out of their hands and buy their products and invest in India. So Shashi, I want to shift focus now from a book that I've been reading for the past one week. Honestly, a very heavy book. Ooh. It was so difficult for me to I'm digest. I'm so sorry, Samira. <sighs> so tell I me, promise you my next one will be an easy breeze. I hope so. I look forward to reading it. Well, I've been going through your book and I realized there were a lot of new words that I had not come across. And I've also learned that you have re added quite a few words to the English dictionary and vocabulary. Wow. I didn't uh, think so, but anyway. Pre-porn? <laughs> have you heard of the word pre-porn? <laughs> yeah. I, I was, I, I, no, no, that, that was, I thought I might have originated it because I sort of came up with it as a student at St. Stephen's and used it in an article and a short story and kept using it. And, and then years later, I came back to India and found it in widespread use. Because I just thought, you know, in English, to advance a meeting, let's say you're supposed to meet somebody at five o'clock. In India, what do we say? We say, hey, listen, I actually have something else at five. Do you mind pre it to four, right? And in English, that doesn't exist, or so I thought. 
So I thought I might have actually come up with this term which is widely used here. But you have but, come up uh, with a few words. No, but that one it turned out the Oxford English Dictionary reached out to me and said actually we have found a reference to this word in 1902 or something oh. in some obscure no longer existing American <laughs> newspaper. So I have to hang my head in shame and say clearly you know ideas out there and they sort of a light on somebody's brain at different times in different places. and the same idea that hit this particular person it didn't catch on there it caught on in india so there we are <laughs> i we can keep talking like this the whole evening i need to hear from the audience sure is Let's... this uh, there are questions that you need to ask are there places you need to go to or from a show of hands do you want us to continue for a bit please let us know looks like they want to ask questions themselves So we have our subcommittee members who are also collecting chits and I, we will thank you but I want to ask one question before we go get to sure. that please okay it's really important i think a lot of people would be interested and won't get a chance to ask you this again china versus india their economy is much bigger than ours they spend much more on their military than us what is the balance sheet if you were a profit what would you say about the next 5 years i'd rather not ask i'd rather you hadn't asked that question because i really think that race is over in 1978 our economy was the same size as china's and we actually had a slightly better per capita income because we had fewer people than they did today their economy is 5 times ours their per capita income is 3 or 2 and a half times ours they're in a different league and we are not playing on that level so my answer is a perhaps a typically indian answer which is that this is a race we don't need to run that there is enough and there should be enough in the world for both india and china to prosper that there should be enough that will actually give indians and i mean ordinary indians who currently are amongst those 26% living below the poverty line three decent meals a day a roof over their heads the prospect of useful and gainful employment and the ability to dream for better lives for their children as long as indians have that i don't care how much better chinese are doing let them flourish they are a different society they're a different culture so i would say nirat we are framing the question wrongly this is not and arguably never was a, a race between china and india it's a race against ourselves against the poverty that assails us the factors holding us back it's a race to be the best india we can be which will not ever be the best that china can be it's a totally different society i mean one of the examples i'm often drawing is 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 about the highways you know china went from 0 kilometers of six lane expressways in 1996 to 150,000 kilometers by 2016. Now, how do they do that? Because in their system, the planners can draw a line on the map and bulldoze anything on in the way. It doesn't matter if it's a church, a temple, a mosque, a graveyard, a school, a home, an entire town. I mean, they will just do it. And they have done it. Whereas in India, you know how it is. You want to widen a two-lane road, and people will not agree about the compensation you're offering they will not want to sell to you or uh, if you still try and use them in a domain protests will start the red flags will come out bollywood stars will come and sit on dharna i mean you know we are like that only so we 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 cannot and should not be in the game of comparing ourselves to china it's a different system different country different objectives they've actually made their omelet by breaking a lot of eggs and that means breaking a lot of necks as well which i would like to think we haven't done very much of and that we at least are more humane we have brought people along in our democracy when there is popular resistance even in narendra modi is tempted to backtrack as we saw on his attempts to change the land acquisition bill there will be things in which india as a democracy will go slower than china but as i say as long as we can create a better india for indians and decent lives for all our people then let the chinese be the chinese it's not our concern and we should not be wasting our energy in competing with them or comparing ourselves to them shashi tharoor thank you very much
So I have this question with me. It says, in your book, you mentioned that the U.S. is now dismissive of international organizations like the U.N. In the past, the USA has actively funded the United Nations to further its international agenda. What, in your opinion, prompted Mr. Trump to change this policy? This question has been asked by Sanjit Ganguly. Are you here in the crowd, Sanjit? Could you raise your hand up? With that light shining raise in our eyes, can one. we even see a yes. hand? Anyway, uh, no, it's, it's a good question. I think Americans have always had a strain uh, of people who, um, frankly, uh, didn't particularly like having to subordinate their interests to um, uh, the United Nations uh, once in a while. Uh, we went through repeated crises when I was there um, involving... Um, the U.S. not paying their dues on time, um, particularly the Americans always felt the U.N. needed them more than they needed us, which is not entirely untrue because, you know, one of the big reasons for the failure of the predecessor organization, the League of Nations, was that the Americans never joined. So when the U.N. was established, every effort was made to bend over backwards to ensure that the Americans joined and felt secure within it, including giving them the veto in the Security Council because they felt that the UN could not afford to suffer the fate of the League of Nations. And that was very much the approach. It's in fact one of the reasons why the UN is located in the US rather than somewhere else, is that that will make it more difficult for the Americans to pull out of the UN. Nonetheless, uh, Mr. Trump's administration has pulled out of UNESCO. Uh, it has not paid many of its dues. There are, I think, um, my former colleagues in the UN are now freezing in winter temperatures because the UN can't afford to heat the offices at the level they used to and so on. So there's a lot of, a lot of um, challenges that have come from that. And it's partly because there is an isolationist streak in America that in all fairness exists in most democracies. Look, there are some people in this room in this hall who have been elected politicians. You ask any of them, how often when you go and seek votes from people, does a foreign policy issue actually determine the vote? The answer is almost never. Nobody votes for you or votes against you because of your stand on the UN. Now in India, the government is free nonetheless to give money to UN organizations or take stands to the UN because foreign policy has still been the preserve of a small governmental elite. The truth is in a country like America, a lot of the US Congress and the US Senate have the attitude that they have absolutely no need to do something which is not going to affect the prospects of re-election for any of them. And so I've actually been, I've met American senators and congressmen when I was at the UN who said to me, We've done surveys of the top 10 issues in our voters' minds. You guys don't even figure in the top 10. Why should I care about you? And I thought that was a very honest way of looking at it. So this is part of the problem. There are many, many democracies, UN, international cooperation, etc. Not, not good. So when your budget is so tight that you're closing an American base, which actually employed people and generated money in the local economy and so on, you know, the U.S. has military bases within its own soil, and they're closing many of these to save money. The same people in those towns where those bases are closing are saying, why are you giving even more money than you're gaining here to the U.N., to a bunch of foreigners? <coughs> Partly, it's a failure of public education. But this is going to be an issue that I think the U.N. is, is going to have a tough time coping with over the years. It's, the only support base for the U.N. in the U.S. is the U.S. diplomats. But now the boss of the U.S. diplomats, the president himself, doesn't understand or appreciate the value of international organization. Okay, I'm merging two questions in one. The first one is from Hemisha De Silva, and the second one is from seven-year-old Thomas. Thomas's question first, can you become the next prime minister of India? <laughs> you heard the laughter, I think that's the answer. Okay, and Hemisha's question is, I wanted to know what is your favorite cuisine or food? Any dish in particular is your go-to comfort food? Two questions. Oh, great questions. Okay. 
So as far as the... Uh, you all want to stand, stand up? up, Hamisha? Yes. And I hope you're a great Thomas, cook because I might be coming to you now for comfort food. Thomas? Yes. And I hope you're a great Thomas, cook because I might be coming to you now for comfort food. Thomas? Can you stand up? Can we see you? Okay, you're shy. Okay, well, shy. for young Thomas, the answer is our system doesn't work that way. We have a parliamentary system, not a presidential one. You, you, in India, we won't have a Barack Obama coming out of nowhere and capturing the imagination of the nation with a couple of speeches and winning primaries and becoming the nominee of the big party and becoming president. In our system, the contest is between parties. And each party has its own existing leadership structure, as my party does. And eventually, when a government is being formed, it is the leader of the party that wins the most seats who tends to become prime minister. Obviously, there is an exception when coalitions are formed, some adjustment has been made. I think Mr. Devagauda was not even a candidate in the elections uh, in which he became prime minister when all the coalition partners were looking for a suitable candidate. And, uh, and such exceptions are there, but they're quite unusual. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh was named at a time when Sonia Gandhiji felt that because of her foreign origin, she couldn't be uh, what she had been elected by the coalition leaders to be, namely uh, Prime Minister at that time. So uh, with these very unusual exceptions, I would say for the most part, it is the ruling party's leader who will be Prime Minister. And uh, I have... Absolutely. I, I know that many people think I'm immodest, but I'm not that immodest. I'm not that divorced from reality. I think I have a, a, an interesting challenge right now as, um, as a member of parliament for Tiruvananthapuram. I have a constituency to pay attention to and a parliament in which I'm proud to be a, a voice for the Congress party. And I will continue to do that. But thank you for asking, Thomas. I'm very touched by your request. Uh, as to the comfort food, a, I'm vegetarian, so I'm afraid none, none of the favorite items of most Bangaloreans would feature. But the people from Woodipi will be happy. I love idlis. I am an idli nut. I cannot live without them. I even used to make my own idlis in New York. Uh, mind you, I made them in batches of about 88 and put them in the freezer and took out four a day to thaw and have. But, uh, but I, I absolutely love idli and in particular, I love it with a pala garden accompaniment which is called ulli samandi that is the tiny onions the shallots ground together with red chilies a little bit of salt and sometimes a pinch of, of tamarind helps lightly roasted in order that you can still be bearable when you breathe into people's faces otherwise the onions can be rather pungent uh, that combination the relative mildness uh, of a fermented idli with the spicy tartness of the Ulli Samandi. That does it for me anytime. That's my comfort food. I have that every morning and I'm proud to say that India has become a sufficiently integrated country that I have been able to get idlis in hotels in Guwahati and in Amritsar, which I never thought would be possible when I was a kid. So, good on you India. <laughs> but anyway, that's my answer to you. So we have a question from Chanel and Kian. They say, Dr. Tarur, we heard that you had started writing from the age of six. Is that so? And we, you know, uh, we want to know who is your role model? Well, look, on the question of the writing, remember, I grew up in an India where there was no television. Obviously, no Nintendo, no PlayStation. No computers, no mobile phones, all of those weren't even gleams in their inventor's eyes. And on top of that, I had the curse of being a rather severely asthmatic child. So, I was not only very often confined to bed, but I couldn't sleep either because when you can't breathe, it's kind of difficult to sleep. So, I was sitting up, propped up in bed, many, many days of the week and very many weeks of the year. So, in those circumstances, um, literally, the only thing I had to keep me sane and, and, and focused and away from my own physical misery was books. So I became an absolutely avid reader at a very young age. Uh, I had the misfortune of being the eldest child, so I didn't have any elder brothers or sisters of books I could read. So I would read all the books I had accessible to me, 
then started reading my parents' books at a ridiculous age, probably because before I was old enough to fully understand them. But I devoured every book I could find on their shelves. And uh, books were my entertainment, they were my education, and they were my escape. In fact, when I really didn't have even the, the mood to read, because I've been doing nothing but that for the preceding 18 hours or something, I would use books again to play a game called Book Cricket which consisted of making up imaginary cricket teams and opening the pages of a fat book. And the last digit of the page number uh, gave you the, the run scored in that particular opening. So I made up all sorts of wonderful matches, played entire series during a bad asthma attack. So books were it for me. And, and therefore, when you finally ran out of anything from your parents' shelves that you could even bear to read, what did you do? You wrote. And so I started writing very imitative, very derivative uh, short stories. You know, I had devoured Enid Blyton. My mother used to read the Noddy books to me when I was tiny. And by the age of two, I had snatched them from her and begun reading them myself. Uh, then the Five Find Outers and the Famous Five and the Secret Seven. So I invented the Six Solvers, who were Indian kids having very similar adventures uh, in a Kerala village because my parents would take me to Kerala every year to their village and that sort of thing and so it was very imitative but it was still an extremely useful apprenticeship and then my father bless his soul got the stories typed up by his secretary so they could actually be passed around to friends and I suddenly had a readership and I kept writing and of course I was kept falling sick so I had to keep writing and uh, at one point, uh, when I was about 10 years old, uh, my dad had enough faith in one of my stories that he sent it off to a Sunday newspaper. The Free Press Journal in Bombay had a Sunday newspaper called the Bharat Jyoti. And to my astonishment, they agreed to publish it. And to see your own name in print, uh, there are writers in this audience, I won't embarrass them by naming them. There's nothing more addictive. It's as bad as the first bite of chocolate to the first kiss you really want to keep seeing it over and over again that way so after my uh, that story was I really began to believe in, my, in myself as a writer I wrote a, a slightly preposterous novella again inspired by what I've been reading I've been reading the Biggles books of Captain W. John and so I wrote about an Anglo-Indian fighter pilot called squadron leader Bellows in a book called Operation Bellows. I thought it was a book, but it wasn't long enough really to be a book. And that was serialized over six installments in the Junior Statesman, uh, the first installment beginning the week before my 11th birthday. So I began writing when I was six. I was published from when I was 10, which is why I can truly claim to have been a published writer for five decades now. Slightly appalling thought, but there you are. And I, 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 I um, never quite looked back. I kept doing it. I mean, I would come home from school and later college, finish my schoolwork or my college work, and then my idea of a good time and spare time was to write rather than to watch TV when TV came or to, to go off and, and play because obviously I was no longer uh, the strapping youth that my classmates were since I'd been nurturing my, my asthma all this time. So that's how my writing began. Uh, there were no real role models in terms of writers. Uh, because, um, I mean, frankly, the idea of a full-time Indian writer barely existed. I and mean, R.K. Narayan was about it. Uh, otherwise, uh, they just weren't. I mean, every Indian writer was doing some other job and writing on the side. And my parents were firmly of the belief that since in any case I was rather good at taking exams and kept coming first in class and so on, that I was destined for a proper professional career. And every time I said I want to be a writer, they would whack me and say, no one makes a living writing. You will write in your spare time, but you will do this first. You know, get good marks in the exams and come back and write after that. So that became my default mode. But I kept writing. I wrote um, uh, not only through school and college, and I, in fact, for my pains, I won the Rajika Kripalani Young Journalist Award for journalists under 30 when I was 20. But then when I joined the UN, I realized that the staff rules had certain restrictions. So I went there and I said to them, listen, other people may collect butterflies or stamps or go hiking on the weekends. What I do is right. And I don't want to be in violation of any rules. So they actually gave me official permission to write 
so long as I didn't violate the staff rules, which meant so long as I didn't offend any member states. And since in those days I was mainly writing fiction, didn't matter. So I would go around joking that, uh, that James Bond had a license to kill, I had a license to write. And with that license to write, there used to be a copyright, I mean a little warning notice below the copyright. If any of you have old editions of my books, up to 2007 when I left the UN, they will say at the bottom of the copyright page, though the author works for the United Nations, none of the opinions expressed by characters in this book are to be construed as those of the organization or of the author in his official capacity. So this kind of disclaimer had to go along with my, with my, uh, with my writing. Truly amazing. And one final question for the evening. Are you ready for it? <laughs> I don't know. It depends. <laughs> so Some questions is... one is never really ready for. <laughs> so this is on behalf... Fortunately, it's too late for her to say, will you be my valentine? <laughs> yeah. So, so this is on behalf of, yeah, of all the ladies here from the committee of Catholic Club, the women's committee. And, yeah, and, uh, you know, they, they had requested me to ask you this. So it comes as a special request. So um, in, in the first hour of releasing the announcement, that you will be in Catholic Club with us for this evening, just after Valentine's Day. Most of the women wanted to know, what is the secret behind your charm? If I knew, I'd turn it on all the time. <laughs> we had 200 tickets sold in the first hour, bought by women. I'm delighted. Listen, I actually have the highest respect for women. I honestly think they are the superior part of the human species. I mean, wow. if you really believe the biblical story, God made man Delighted to and hear decided that from he you. could do better. And then came woman, right? So that's the thing. But jokes apart, I was actually mentioning to one of you before the session that I've just come from a convocation at St. John's Medical College. And I have, ever since coming back to India, I've been chief guest at dozens of convocations, over 50. And I began noticing over the years that even in educational institutions where the overwhelming majority of the student body was male, always the majority of the prize winners were female. And I began to say, today at St. John's, I said, I'm going to count because fortunately uh, I wasn't the one giving out the prizes. I gave out the degrees. And then I was allowed to sit down while the director of the medical college gave out the prizes. So I started counting. And there were 46 Sorry, 44 prize winners, of whom 33 were female. Wow. 75%. Wow. Lovely. And I just feel this country is going in the right direction. The better, more capable, more diligent, more conscientious, more honest, more hardworking people are the ones winning the prizes and coming to the fore. So, uh, Margaret, I don't think we need to fight too hard for the Women's Reservation Bill because they will eventually, I think, take over this country they have they've demonstrated in so many ways the extraordinary extraordinary I mean when you really think about it the 21st century terms what can a man do that a woman can't but there are things a woman can do that a man can't and I won't go into the details right so we men are very lucky that you folks are suffering us in the positions we're in for as long as you are so that I think is my last word on women for now more power to them that's really inspiring and from all the women here, we really salute you for very genuinely recognizing, uh, you know, the contribution of women who otherwise are locked behind doors and work hard right from the early morning hours till late night and the system goes on. But when leaders like you stand up and, you know, share your insights with the rest of the world, it truly makes a difference. On behalf of at least the women here of Catholic Club, we salute you. Thank you. Yeah. I also want to make a special mention out here. We have Ramesh, who is the um, speaker, the former speaker. A big round of applause. If we could all see you, please stand up. 
we also have uh, Mr. Harris, the MLA of our constituency. Thank you once again for all your support. We have Mr. Govind Raj, who is the former MLC, the standing MLC. Once a big, a big round of applause to you who are with us. We end this session um, by thanking you all. You have been a very appreciative audience and we really uh, are excited by uh, the responsiveness that you have shown us through this session. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. You've been a great audience. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank